got the British Medical Journal attacking you, attacking the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, partly because you embraced the term herd immunity. Well, the, herd, the term herd immunity is a scientific fact. I mean, what is going on here? Yeah, it's very strange. It's like attacking somebody for believing in uh, gravity. Both gravity and herd immunity are known uh, scientific phenomena. So it's very strange uh, what they wrote in the British Medical Journal. I think it's very uh, embarrassing for the British Medical Journals that they publish uh, uh, sort of tabloid gossip and slander. Why are they doing this, Martin? Why is there such a desire by, I would describe them as the scientific establishment, but I would also say the political establishment, the media establishment. Why is there a desire to not question the efficacy of lockdowns, especially given this is such a new addition to the public health playbook? Yeah, it's sort of surprising, but I guess that, I mean, they implemented their preferred option with the universal lockdowns, and we now know that they didn't work. Uh, they said that it would protect the older vulnerable people, but uh, it didn't. A lot of people died. So it's clear now that what they uh, proposed and what they implemented didn't work. So uh, they don't have any arguments anymore. So instead of arguing the science, they are using slander and, uh, um, and smears. Because what we should have done was to do better protection of the of the older high risk people who are high risk of uh, mortality because well anybody can get the disease there's more than a thousand fold difference between the old and the young young in terms of uh, uh, dying so uh, again this winter there's going to be another way so we have to do much better at protecting the older vulnerable people not uh, through vaccinations but also through other means. Well, I agree. I I signed the Great Barrington Declaration as you know, and I have been horrified by the way that the establishment and big tech have tried to shut it down. And actually, Martin, as you see the rest of the world try and deal with COVID and all of these COVID success stories in the early days of 2020, like New Zealand and Australia, uh, still remained locked down. Surely that's even more reason for us to start talking about whether this policy actually works. Yeah, so general lockdowns can sort of push the problem into the future a little bit. That's what it can accomplish. Yeah, it just delays, uh, but that also, it delays the inevitable, right? Yeah, so uh, with the virus like, uh, uh, like this, everybody's going to be infected sooner or later. So uh, the, the key thing is to uh, make sure that all the people are protected and uh, uh, that they are vaccinated. Uh, before they get infected. But for children, this is a very mild disease. Uh, 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 the risk for dying is extremely minuscule, so they need to go to school and live their normal lives. And yep. the collateral public health damage that we have seen from these uh, uh, lockdowns has been enormous, uh, from cancer, cardiovascular disease, mental health, and so on. Absolutely. And, I mean, of course, I respect people who have a different view. I respect people who want lockdowns and, and think that's the right approach. I disagree with it strongly. But what's so disturbing to me, and I think to you too, is that a lot of the lockdown zealots, as I describe them, don't, e don't even believe that there should be a debate. They don't even think there should be a proper cost-benefit analysis done of lockdown. Yeah, and that's very strange. So uh, if there's a scientist in the UK who believes in these lockdowns, then I'd be happy to uh, have a debate with them. Uh, yeah. But we shouldn't uh, resort to slander and uh, lies. That's, uh, that just uh, reduces the trust that public have, both in public health and in science in general. Yeah, because one so of the things the, the British Medical Journal uh, sounds so outraged about is the fact that your colleague and, and one of uh, the joint authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, uh, Sunitra Gupta, who's, of course an eminent uh, Oxford University professor got time to meet with Boris Johnson before the second lockdown last year. And that seems to outrage them. Whereas I would say, no, you want the prime minister to be getting lots of advice before he makes his decision. Yeah, and I think it's a responsibility of a public health scientist to uh, 
to meet with uh, politicians and talk about uh, the science and explain the technology in a setting like this, because the politicians need to learn about these things. And they need to hear from different people. So I think that's just uh, the duty of somebody like uh, uh, Dr. Gupta, who is one of the preeminent infectious disease technologists in the world. Look, Martin, I want to bring in my superstar panel tonight. I've got the former editor of the Daily Star, Dawn Neeson, here, the former Liberal Democrat MP, Lempik Opa. But let me kick off with the GB News head of digital, Becca Hudson. Becca, do you agree with this? Um, I, I broadly don't. And I, I'm quite interested to know, do you think that if we had adhered to the, to the policies and the kind of the concepts that you raised in the declaration, would we have had a, a lower death toll? It feels no, probably not, because... We, there's no, nowhere in the declaration do you outline how we protect vulnerable people from having the disease transmitted to them by healthy people. So the healthy people might get it and survive, but there wasn't really much in terms of how to safeguard those vulnerable people if we didn't do a lockdown. Well, you obviously didn't read the declaration because both in the one-page declaration there are concrete things, but also there's an FAQ that goes with it where there are several pages and uh, more than a dozen very concrete proposals uh, that should have been implemented. And if we had implemented this uh, focused protection of the old, we would have seen less death among the old and vulnerable. How many lives? Uh, it's sort of basic how principles of uh, public health that were thrown out the window. How many lives do you think you could have saved by not locking down and yeah. relying on spurious herd immunity? Uh, potentially half of them. But that's hard to say. It's depending on how uh, how well it was how well it was done. I mean, you you can't save everybody in a pandemic. There will always be some mortality. And what I read: How do you stop healthy people transmitting this to vulnerable people or people with previous conditions if there are not lockdowns? So, if we take, for example, uh, nursing home as one example, this is one of many, where uh, uh, the most vulnerable is. One thing that we should have done very early is that uh, uh, staff, we should have used more staff that have other had COVID because they have natural immunity. So they're less likely to transmit it to, uh, to the residents of, of these nursing homes. So we should have deliberately used uh, people with natural immunity for that. And we should continue to do that. Yeah. Uh, we should multi, reduce the staff rotation between nursing homes because at least in the US, some, uh, uh, some staff work at more than one nursing homes they work overtime in a different place and that can transmit it much more. So you want to have the residents have as few contacts with as few staff as possible. There should have been much more frequent testing of uh, nursing home staff to test schools doesn't really help with the pandemic, but we should have more frequent testing of nursing home staff on a, on a daily basis. But so practice. those are things that uh, we could have done to, uh, to reduce the mortality in nursing homes. But I suppose in practice we don't have that many nurses, we didn't have that much, that many staff, did we, in our nursing homes or our care home sector? So I, I appreciate the argument, but that in practical terms that wasn't possible, especially here in the UK. And what would be the approach for multi-generational households? Uh, so one thing that they did in the US that was wrong is they sent the students home from the universities into multi-generational homes. Uh, so instead of uh, uh, potentially infecting uh, a, a friend who is 20 years old, who has very little mortality, they were sent home to uh, uh, infect their uh, older parents or grandparents and so on. So that was a very counterproductive uh, way that increased the spread within multi-generational homes to send uh, college students home from the universities. I don't know if the UK did the same thing, but that was then in the US. That's just okay. one example. Uh, Limbit Opec, yeah. what do you um, make of it? I, I find your thesis interesting. I find Becca's questions interesting too. The question I've been wrestling with is this. Is the problem having chosen the wrong route or is the problem continuously changing the route it seems to me that we started with herd immunity, then we went to lockdown, then we came back to herd immunity, and now we're somewhere between the two. And I'm feeling that it's the lack of strategic consistency that's killed people. But what's your view? I think the need to protect the, uh, the older high-risk people is always there. But it's, of course, much higher during uh, the peak of the wave. So you can't, uh, you, if you, if you, you can't necessarily prevent uh, older people from seeing, seeing loved ones uh, for, for a long time. So 
I think it makes sense that during the peaks, that that's when you put in more uh, more stronger measures to protect the older people uh, than you do, for example, during the summer when there's fewer, uh, where there's less uh, transmission. Well, direct question, which actually ties into what Becca was asking. If we just stayed with herd immunity, which I know Becca's skeptical about, if we just stayed with that, which I believe the Prime Minister wanted to do, at the beginning and gone all the way through, would fewer people have died? Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, if we have done focus protection, fewer people would have died. I don't know what you mean with staying with herd immunity, because whatever strategy we use, the end is herd immunity. And that's when the pandemic it's ends. How and the I, mean, pandemic I, mean, I mean, no lockdown, starts. no real lockdown, a, a kind of a Swedish approach. Yeah, so I think uh, Sweden right now is in a much better position than the UK is right now. Dawn Neeson. I was, I, was getting, I was going to ask that, that, that very question. Which countries do you think have handled the pandemic as, as well as any country possibly could? And which countries have totally messed it up? Uh, I think that the Scandinavian countries in general have done a very balanced approach. Uh, there were some mistakes, such as they didn't protect the nursing home rest, uh, in Stockholm early on. But uh, the Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Denmark have had much lighter lockdown measures, less uh, restrictions, less interruptions. And the results uh, have been uh, uh, fairly good on the COVID mortality, but equally important, there's been less collateral damage mm. uh, on this. A place that did terrible was New York and New Jersey. Those are some of the worst parts, I think, uh, uh, in the world. Uh, one reason was that they actually sent sick nursing people from hospitals to nursing homes. And that was sort of actively, uh, an actively very negative, very de uh, deadly thing to do. So I would say they, they're probably up there at some of the worst. Well, it's uh, been places. a fascinating discussion as ever. Martin Calder, the epidemiologist, biostatistician, and of course, co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration. Thank you for joining us on Uncancer. Thank you so much, and thank you for a very nice discussion between the four, with the four of you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Martin. Much appreciated. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe, and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.